Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? What a lovely day it is today. All the snow's gone, the temperature shot up 10 degrees. We've got low white cloud, so uh, the house is actually a lot warmer. If you live in the country, you'll know what I mean about the house being warmer because the house, a house in the country is basically a field with a house in. Oh, dead badger there. So you don't see these things, well, you might see them in the town, I don't know. I don't think you see them so much. But uh, no, you're, uh, if you live in the country, then basically you have to accept that you're actually living in the country. And uh, there, but for the grace of the house, you would just be standing in a field. So, uh, nearly a dead jogger there. So, um, yeah, so you have to let all the wildlife in and, you know, and all the flies. You can imagine you're a fly, you're flying around in a field, you know, looking for a nice pile of dung somewhere and then all of a sudden you bump into some bloody great pile of bricks that someone stuck in the middle of the field. Ah! Ah! Is that, are you going to, I mean, are you going to say, oh no, that's someone's house, I'll just avoid that? No, you think, oh, well, I'll give that a quick look round as well. I mean, I'm in the middle of a field, after all, you know, I might as well. <laughs> the, house, the house is in the field, right? It's not like uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's where it should be. So you get used to it, you know, being living in the living in the country. And uh, one of the things is uh, moving up and down with the temperatures. You know, if the, if the temperatures minus four outside, then you're doing quite well if you get your house up to ten. <laughs> That's a fourteen degree differential. That's actually the same as it being 10 outside and you getting your house up to 22. In fact, it's, it's, you're doing better to get your house up to 10 when it's minus 4 than you are to get it up to 22 when it's 10. So, uh, anyway. So, what's up, what's up? The uh, NASDAQ, the National Association of Specialist Dentists, Accountants and Lawyers or something, have just released their annual benchmarking figures. It's all very hush-hush. It's all very embargoed and everything, and you're not uh, you're not supposed to. Uh, they say you're not supposed to reproduce it or disseminate it or anything, and it's all dead top secret and everything. And um, I think that's a bit. That's a bit. They're a bit over protectionist about it. So I'm going to tell you some of the figures, but don't tell them that I told you, okay? But they give it to me because I sort of report on it. I don't know who they think I'm going to report on it to. If I'm, how do you report on something and don't disseminate it? You know, I mean, I can understand that uh, they get a bit precious because they put a lot of work into producing these figures, and they see that as a sort of a competitive advantage that they've got this data and their opponents haven't. But um, but then then they go and release it on a on a press day in front of the dental press. So I assume that they. Uh, know that some of it is going to get released yeah, but but I think that possibly they're hoping that no one's going to be irresponsible enough to release so much that it seriously undermines their competitive advantage you know but these figures are quite closely followed because they they're sort of the state of the nation type thing they sort of give you a health of the profession and they split it quite handily into NHS private and mixed and NHS and private they define as someone who's more than 80% dependent on that system and I presume they mean financially not by number of patients because you could be you could be 80% private but have 90% of your patients registered on the NHS which sounds a bit sort of counterintuitive but it depends but if you did it on income then you need far fewer private patients to give you a much higher percentage of your turnover than you do NHS patients so the news is, is pretty good, you know, the, uh, after years and years and years of um, complaining that uh, there's, a bloke, there's a bloke cycling just right in the middle of the road here, just right in the middle of the road. Oh, I don't know what, I don't know what he, he just hasn't got a clue, he's got no situational awareness, he's got no mirrors, but he's got a webcam on his hat. It should be pointing backwards and connected to some Google glasses so he can see what's coming up his rear. Anyway, uh, yeah, so good news. So good news for uh, private, certainly, because private was it's sort of got to be the bit of Cinderella, you know, the, uh, 
um, of the three, mixed practices were always the ones that were doing really well. And then after that, sort of NHS, and then after that, bringing up the rear private, which was which is odd, you know. It's, I, I think it's symptomatic of the sort of the vestigial private sector in this uh, in this country, and also uh, the fact that there, you know people have pretty low expectations in terms of their teeth. You know, they really the NHS has taught them to expect nothing, and I'm going to come on to that in a minute. But um, the average uh, dentist is expected to be turning over about 240, 250, 245,000 pounds a year. So that's uh, gross income before expenses. So just for the Daily Mail, in case the Daily Mail is watching this, that's not how much a dentist earns a year, that is how much a dentist business earns a year in turnover, okay? And there are two things to be taken off of that. One is the expenses, and then there is the uh, income tax and national insurance comes off after that. So, net, uh, we're expected to earn about just over 50% of that. So I think income's supposed to be about 140,000 a year. So, Which was, I was gobsmacked, I was gobsmacked. I mean, I thought I was a dentist and I own and run a dental surgery. Whereas, in fact, what I have now found out from these figures is that although I am technically a dentist, my surgery is is a hobby. It's <laughs> somewhat of a, somewhat of a. I mean, my Nasdal, Alan Suggett, who does these, lovely guy and uh, very experienced in the dental world, uh, if a bit, a bit of a technophobe, but uh, uh, you know, he does my accounts, and God knows what my figures are going to do to his averages. My, my surgery, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I'll be pleased to earn 140,000 in three years, let alone, let alone one. So, uh, so if my surgery wasn't included in these figures, turnover would probably be about 300,000 a year and take home would be about two. So uh, there you go, I'm oh, sorry about that, you know. <laughs> so that was a bit of an eye opener to me. Anyway, uh, Nasdaq, I'm sure, they'll send you these benchmarking statistics if you ask them to because it's a service that they provide. So uh, I, I, would, I would ask for them because I think that they are excellent. And they give you all sorts of other information like what percentage uh, on average materials are and what percentage on average labs are, etc, etc. So that you can sort of see how you're doing relative to everyone else. It's a sort of wisdom of the crowd type approach where you, you work on the basis that every, everybody else has got to be reasonably correct, you know. So, or, or rather collectively, they're gonna be somewhere. It's like the old guess the beans in the jar thing, you know? Some people will say a million, other people will say 10. But, um, but on average, you know, when, when the thousands of guesses are all averaged out, they'll probably be within a bean or two of the actual figure. Um, it's the old bell-shaped distribution in terms of the guesses. So, oh, here we go. So, you know, what, what, so private's on the way up, NHS is, is just about holding its own and mixed practices are not doing so brilliantly. And they sort of hypothesize that this is because mixed practices have lost the plot a bit really and they're doing, they're doing their private a bit more like the NHS rather than, you know, they can't do the NHS to the standard of the private work. So what they do is they dumb down, they dumb down the private work which tends to suggest if you're a patient, you're better off going to a private dentist rather than a mixed practice. Because if, and, and, and this is my experience as well, you know, the, um, when, when the big conversion to the private sector came about in 1992, there was a separate category called uh, independent, uh, as in independent of the National Health Service. And it wasn't private, uh, because private scared the patients off in terms of the fees, but it was a sort of NHS plus. And it sounds as though the mixed practices are running a sort of NHS plus type attitude approach. Um, and they are, you know, I, I, I am seeing this on a daily basis. I, in fact, you wouldn't believe what I'm seeing on a daily basis. Every patient that comes to me from the NHS has got a fresh horror story. I'll give you two examples who came, that came in this week. Uh, one is a patient who lost a lower right central 
and uh, was made a lower partial acrylic denture no clasps nothing just just a bulky horseshoe with a, with a tooth on the front and the tooth itself was was quite a good match and it looked all right when it was in but the problem was that she hated it because it never stayed it never stayed anywhere it was only ever any use when she was just sitting still with her mouth shut <laughs> so so uh, and that in itself you know it's only not so terrible you might say oh well you know I mean, that is an accepted type of denture and and sometimes patients don't get on with dentures and blah 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 except that she had other lower teeth missing she had the lower left four five and six missing and that is a first for me that's the first time I've ever seen and I said to her you know did you have you lost these other teeth since you had the denture made no 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 the denture was made like a few months ago so someone has made a lower denture with a single tooth on it to replace uh, four teeth you know it doesn't obviously doesn't replace the other three teeth it just doesn't even go anywhere near and you've got a patient there who's complaining of lack of retention lack of stability where if they had actually put the other three teeth on might have been okay you know might have had a bit more stability and a bit more retention and wouldn't be coming to see me and I just don't understand the thinking behind that you know I just can't understand even being charitable and saying well perhaps the dentist thought that a smaller denture might be more tolerable you know I have never I do not I did not understand that we have arrived now at the situation on the NHS where it's acceptable to make a denture that does not replace all the teeth it, the advantage of a denture was always that, you know, as opposed to like an implant or a crown, uh, or an implant or a bridge, that, that filled a particular gap. A, a denture would always fill all the gaps, and so it was more cost effective that in that it solved every problem, and not just one problem. But now that we've seen the birth of a denture that fills, that, that, that solves one problem, uh, I just don't understand the mentality of it. I think there must be... I'm sure it's a product of this one size fits all, you know, three bears porridge approach to fees, where you've got three fees and your only job is to do the absolute minimum possible possible work to, to, to earn the fee. And that's a one tooth denture. This is this is a classic example of a one tooth denture earning the same as a four, a three or four tooth denture. And you know, arguably being easier to fit, possibly a, a cheaper lab bill and easier to make. And another example of this, because I'm not, you know, I'm not one to conjure demons out of nothing, because I'm seeing a clear pattern here. We had another patient in last week who had um, lost a bridge, uh, lower left five, six, seven. Um, and wanted to, wanted to have it replaced, you know, just literally wanted a replacement bridge. And you're talking here about a pretty, pretty standard, straightforward bridge case, sort of thing a student in a dental school would have no trouble doing. Uh, the teeth are already prepared, and quite decent prepared, you know, the preps are okay. The, um, there's plenty of uh, occlusal height and space, the, the gap is fine. It's really, is pretty, it's just a pretty routine posterior bridge. And what the dentists had done was they had crowned the seven and left the five as a prep. I mean, pause for effect, right? You think this is like, you know, square brackets in italics, S-I-C, square brackets. They literally crown the seven and they put a non-precious metal on the uh, crown on the seven. And the patient said that she uh, uh, was unhappy that she still, she'd asked for a bridge and she'd still got the gap. And then how do I explain that to her? How do I explain? <laughs> she wants answers from me and I'm gonna, I want to explain, other than that dentist had a brain tumour, how am I supposed to explain that? They've crowned the seven and left the gap and the five as a prep. And then, and then it dawned to me, you know, it sort of dawned on me slowly that this is, this is symptomatic, right? Symptomatic of the, of the three bears approach to fees. They're, what the dentist is going to do, they're going to get two fees, aren't they? They're going to get two band three quarters of treatment out of this. How to turn a one a one band three course of treatment into two band three courses of treatment? Of course, you crown the you crown the seven and then you do a cantilever bridge from the five on 
a cantilever to replace the six. Never mind about the fact that it could be done in one job, one band, one course of treatment, one series of visits. Never mind about the fact that you're cantilevering a six off of a five. Just think of the the two band threes, the 500 quid you're going to get for doing it. And this is, this is how NHS profitability is holding up in the Nasdaq figures. The, the, you know, when my challenge to visit any NHS dentist in the country and if they are, if they're making a reasonable profit doing good quality dentistry as they all claim, to shout from the rooftops the best practice that they and only they have probably discovered which is you know the NHS way now isn't it find best practice and share it so why aren't they why aren't they coming up with all these uh, examples of how NHS dentists have managed to turn it turn it you know earn as much as private dentists earn as much as private dentists this is how you must ask yourself how does an NHS dentist earn as much as if not more than a private dentist and the answer is that there must be, you know, that some either there's either some economies of scale or some way of uh, bearing in mind, you know, that you're getting three UDAs for a course of treatment that involves a checkup, uh, an uh, X-rays if necessary, scan and polish if necessary, any number of any number of fillings included, any number of root treatments included, any number of extractions included, any other treatment bite rehabs included uh, for for about 75 quid. That's the fee that the dentist gets, about 75 quid. Or if he's an associate and uh, he doesn't have to pay his expenses of the 25, say, or 27 now, which a UDA is, the, the associate's getting about 10. So you, an associate's getting paid about 30 pounds for that amount of work. That All that work, 30 quid. And yet, NHS dentists are earning the same as private dentists. You, you know, you have to, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I don't, my, my challenge was never taken up uh, and that's been on the table for 10 years that challenge and now I know it never will be because if dentists are doing uh, turning a simple three unit bridge into two bridges uh, or turning a, a four tooth denture into a one tooth denture then no one is ever going to admit anyone into their practice are they to see that being done and that's how they're doing it. That's how they. That's how they must be doing it. If you think that you know of another way that they're doing it, then please, please, I beg you, I beg you, reply to me, contact me. The all the details are in the show notes below. Please let me know if there's an alternative model where that they can NHS dentists can earn the same as private dentists without without taking the abuse of the system to extraordinary lengths and and I say extraordinary because I think turning one three unit bridge into two bridges one of which is a six cantilevered off of a five I think is extraordinary and it's one of those things where you can't you know like you did you do a double take and you know <laughs> how the hell how am I going to explain this you, you know, and I do. I don't shy away from saying that I think that it was done for the purposes of double claiming the fee. I, I will tell the patient that, but I, I have to tell them that that's a sad state of the National Health Service at the moment, and it's it's a sort of the inevitable consequence of the of the fee structure. And I don't condone it. I, I have in the past said that. Uh, the Department of Health gets the sort of work that they pay for. They decide what the system is, and then they uh, uh, they they will then get what they pay for. And then because dentists are not stupid, they will look at what they're being paid for. They will assume that's what's wanted, and then they will provide it. <clears throat> and if the NH if the NHS is paying for a ton of uh, courses flat on a flat rate basis, where all you need to do is is the absolute minimum necessary to, to earn the fee, then um, then uh, that's what they'll get, and that's what they'll deserve. And then they, they have the gall to complain that that's not what they want. You know? <laughs> pay for what you want. <laughs> pay, pay for what you want, and then you'll get it, okay? And the, the problem is that 
I think these these sort of stories you think well you know that's that's ridiculous you know that is he's made that up or 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 another way of looking at it saying yeah well I understand there was a bit of abuse going on and then patients are getting referred to the hygienist to should it be having a should be having scale and polish on a on a you know included on the NHS and I've got a patient in the other day who brought in their NHS quote and on it was on it was you know this X treatment and then on the private side was a root treatment and I said really you know this root treatment should be doing done on the NHS and there it is plain in black and black and white you know absolutely <laughs> proof in black and white that people are paying no attention at all to the NHS regs they're choosing to do stuff privately that they should be doing on the NHS that the attempts by the Department of Health to try and stop them doing this are, are, are failing because they're not policing the system to the extent that they need to. And that the, the, the ridiculous nature of the stories that we're hearing, they're getting more and more ridiculous. You could not make this stuff up because the system is in free fall. You know, the system is, is, in, is in fin de regime. It's close to collapse. You know, it was set up by Barry Cockroft and it's been presided over by a woman who was never worked in general practice and doesn't know, probably doesn't know what's going on and probably wouldn't know what to do about it if she knew. So the future's very bleak and I think that's reflected in the figures, in, in the sort of resurgence of the private side. And I think the private sector is, is incredibly undervalued and I think it's going to be... I think there's going to be an explosion in private dentistry when the NHS system collapse, collapses. And the problem is that the abuse gets worse, you know, we, we found this with all the contracts, with the 1990 contract, three contract work, 56 contract, whatever it was. The, the, the dentists find ways to abuse the contract, you know, the loopholes, they find the loopholes. It takes a few years and this contract's been in for, what, over 10 years now. I mean, there's more than enough time to find the loopholes. And as the time goes by, uh, they're going to push the boundaries. They're like young kids, you know. They just push, 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 push all the time. And the only way to... Um, the only, there, there, there are two ways to do this and solve this problem. And one is to, um, is to keep changing the contract so that the rules keep changing and so, so that you go through another few years where uh, everybody's abiding by the rules until they find out where, where the tips and tricks are, you know. Or the um, the other way of doing it is to come up with a genuine contract that literally rewards dentists for doing good dentistry, you know, and, and improving oral health. Um, and uh, the Department of Health is, I don't think, is capable of doing that. I don't think they are. I don't think they understand the dynamics of it. You know, I don't think they understand what you need, how you need to work with dentists to get to get an improve, improvement in oral health and a reduction in budgets. Um, so I think that one is the least likely, and yet that one would be the best solution, you know. I think the most likely is that we will just have another new contract. You know, there'll be a, a big collapse, this one will collapse in a bunch of acrimony and teeth that extracted that should have been root treated, etc., etc. And We'll have a new contract and we'll go through this whole thing about our oh, dentists were cheating the old system and et cetera, et cetera. And, um, so we're bringing in a new contract and unlike all the other new contracts, which were all brilliant at the time, but we, we, we now recognise we're all crap. This new contract is genuinely brilliant and uh, will solve all the problems. And then, But even before it comes in, um, nuisances like me will point out what's wrong with it, you know, how it's going to fail. Because, you know, we... If you're a theoretician, you can see how these things are going to fail well before they get implemented. So sorry to be on a bit of a downer there, but you know, you don't care, do you? Because you're going to you're 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 soaring off your 140 grand a year, aren't you? Before tax, so you don't care. So <laughs> all right, uh, nice to talk to you. Some of these videos are coming out out of sequence because um, I um, had some technical problems. So there's quite a bit of backlog still recorded. So I'm going to release it. But I'm going to release one or two out of sequence because this one, because it's time sensitive and because of the data, I'll, I'll put this out today and then I'll put the rest of the stuff up as soon as I can. OK, nice to talk to you. Hope you're well and uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye.